This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, President Trump delivered his third State of the Union address Tuesday night, just a day before the Republican-controlled Senate is expected to vote to acquit him in the third presidential impeachment trial in U.S. history. Trump's speech sounded at times like a campaign rally, with Republican lawmakers chanting four more years. Trump focused much of his speech on the economy and immigration. He never once mentioned his impeachment trial. And my fellow citizens, three years ago, we launched the great American comeback. Tonight, I stand before you to share the incredible results. Jobs are booming, incomes are soaring, Poverty is plummeting, crime is falling, confidence is surging, and our country is thriving and highly respected again. The night was filled with drama of a reality TV show. Prior to the speech, President Trump refused to shake House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's hand. Once his speech was over, Pelosi was seen on television ripping up her copy of the speech from the podium. She later called the speech a manifesto of mistruths. A number of Democrats walked out during Trump's address. Congress member Rashida Tlaib walked out after Trump touted the appointment of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Ohio Congress member Tim Ryan walked out, then tweeted, I've had enough. It's like watching professional wrestling. It's all fake. Massachusetts Congress member Seth Moulton and Bill Pascrell of New Jersey also walked out. A number of Democrats boycotted the night altogether, including Alexandria Casio Cortez of New York, Ayanna Presley of Massachusetts, Maxine Waters of California, presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard of Hawaii, Al Green of Texas, Bobby Rush of Illinois, Hank Johnson of Georgia, Steve Cohen of Tennessee, Earl Blumenauer of Oregon, and Frederica Wilson of Florida. None of them came. During Trump's speech, the father of one of the victims of the mass shooting in Parkland, Florida, was thrown out after he shouted about his daughter's his daughter uh, uh, Jamie's death. Fred Guttenberg was House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's guest at the State of the Union. He interrupted Trump's speech when Trump touted his pro-gun positions, and Melania Trump bestowed the Medal of Freedom on right-wing radio host Rush Limbaugh, who was who has spread racist conspiracy theories about former President Barack Obama, among other racist lies. We're joined by two guests, Lee Fong, investigative journalist at The Intercept, still with us from San Francisco, and here in New York, the award-winning journalist Roberto Lovato and the author of the forthcoming book, Unforgetting, a Memoir of Revolution and Redemption. Lee, let's start with you. Give us an overview of the State of the Union address and what exactly took place last night. Well, look, the Constitution provides that the president is expected on it to correspond with Congress with uh, his or her legislative priorities. Over the last 100 years, this has manifested in this State of the Union address before a joint session of Congress. And over the last decade or so, um, it's really become more of a, a partisan political theater um, that's divorced from the actual legislative priorities of the president. It was clear from anyone watching this, this was a campaign rally speech. Uh, Trump previewing his election message for 2020, uh, talking about the success of the economy, uh, throwing red meat to his base on guns, abortion, um, talk radio, Rush Limbaugh. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's an interesting dynamic here, too, in that it looked like Trump was pivoting back to his 2016 message, um, actually trying to co-opt Democrats by talking about um, how he would protect Social Security and Medicare, um, increase social spending, boost uh, uh, infrastructure spending, uh, tackle uh, drug prices. Um, this is kind of unusual for a Republican in the modern era, but that was the campaign message uh, that Trump ran on in 2016. Simultaneously, he painted a really lurid picture of immig immigrant crime, of terrorists murdering Americans, um, and the need for law enforcement and ICE to keep us safe. So he's simultaneously uh, co-opting these core economic ideas from Democrats while pushing xenophobia and hate uh, and demonizing immigrants, uh, demonizing foreigners. 
Um, this is the combination that we're seeing in the populist right all over the Western industrial world. This is the campaign message and strategy that Boris Johnson used in the December election in the UK. This is what the hard right and popular right ha has used in Poland and Hungary, uh, co-opting on the left on, on some core economic ideas while demonizing uh, immigrants and, and boosting xenophobia. Uh, Lee, let's go back to, to hear President Trump speaking last night. After decades of flat and falling incomes, wages are rising fast, and wonderfully, they are rising fastest for low-income workers who have seen a 16 percent pay increase since my election. This is a blue-collar boom. Real median household income is now at the highest level ever recorded. Since my election, U.S. stock markets have soared 70 percent, adding more than $12 trillion to our nation's wealth, transcending anything anyone believed was possible. This is a record. It is something that every country in the world is looking up to. They admire. That, that was President Trump talking about the economic accomplishments of his administration. Of course, Lee, in that, when he mentions the 16 percent rise in the, the income of low-income workers, never mentions the fact that it's largely a result of a $15 an hour movement sweeping the country, not had, having nothing to do with, uh, with the administration, but actually with a popular movement that developed uh, to w raise wages. He also never mentioned perhaps the signature accomplishment of his administration, his tax reform, uh, his, uh, his tax bill. Uh, wondering your, your sense on his, uh, his speaking about his economic accomplishments. Juan, that's an incredibly important point. And I think it implicitly uh, shows the, the weakness of Trump's actual legislative accomplishment. His biggest legislative accomplishment by far was his tax cut bill. Um, that's over $5 trillion over 10 years, uh, weighted mostly to wealthy individuals and corporations, um, boosting the stock market as, as corporations use that extra cash to buy back their stock shares, uh, enriching their in investors. But, you know, for Trump, who's focusing on the, his reelection, I think he's, he's implicitly acknowledging that his own base isn't happy with his biggest legislative accomplishment. He doesn't want to talk about all the trillions of dollars he's shifting upwards to CEOs and, and wealthy individuals. Instead, he's, he's talking about um, kind of vague economic stats and, and, and again, pivoting to the, the red meat uh, cultural conservative values. Let's return to President Trump speaking last night. From the instant I took office, I moved rapidly to revive the U.S. economy, slashing a record number of job-killing regulations, enacting historic and record-setting tax cuts, and fighting for fair and reciprocal trade agreements. So, gutting regulations. Uh, Li Fang, you just did an incredible piece, The Playbook for Poisoning the Earth. Explain what you found. Well, look, this uh, investigation took us over a year. Uh, we have uh, lots of exclusive emails and lobbying documents. But the kind of big picture view of this is that over the last 30 years, um, there's a new chemical compound, um, neonicotinoids. They're now the most widely used insecticide in the world. And they are increasingly blamed for insect in extinctions, non-target insects, all across the world. That's why we're seeing disappearing bumblebees and solitary bees, dragonflies and butterflies. And, um, you know, I, I, don't, I know we don't have time to go deeply into this piece, but uh, when Trump talks about uh, cutting regulations, cutting red tape, um, just in the last week, uh, his EPA rubber stamped the reapproval of these uh, dangerous pesticides. Uh, meanwhile, the EU is moving to ban them. Um, this is the reason that we're seeing an ecological collapse in, in many areas, um, a loss of biodiversity across the country. Well, uh, Trump also had much to say about immigration. Uh, and I want to—let's see if we have that clip uh, when he talks in his State of the Union. If forcing American taxpayers to provide unlimited free health care to illegal aliens sounds fair to you, then stand with the radical left. 
But if you believe that we should defend American patients and American seniors, then stand with me and pass legislation to prohibit free government health care for illegal aliens. This will be a tremendous boon to our already very strongly guarded southern border, where, as we speak, a long, tall, and very powerful wall is being built. We have now completed over 100 miles and have over 500 miles fully completed in a very short period of time. Early next year, we will have substantially more than 500 miles completed. That was President Trump last night. We're joined now by Roberto Lovato, award-winning journalist. Uh, Roberto, your take on the president's uh, uh, remarks last night about immigration, uh, and also not only about immigration, but supposedly the huge crime wave that's occurring as a result of sanctuary cities uh, permitting uh, uh, undocumented immigrants who were jailed by local uh, from ICE deta detainers. It's become predictable if you look at last year's State of the Union address. It's some of the same tropes, same criminals, same uh, immigrants uh, stealing jobs. I mean, this this is tried and true for them. They're, the Republicans are going to use it because it works for them. And it, they're also Trump is also playing to the fact that the Democrats don't really have much to offer on immigration. Nancy Pelosi may have ripped the speech, but they both draw from the same playbook on issues like immigration, foreign policy, corporate domination. And so Trump knows that. And, and, and something that was clear to me, for example, was that Trump didn't say anything about El Paso, right, where you had all these Latinos that were murdered, mass murdered, by a, a white uh, killer who was inspired by Trump's rhetoric and that of the, the extreme right. And so you, you, you didn't have any of those victims in the audience. You know, you had other victims. And, and uh, we're at a very dangerous time. And, and, and I think that immigration uh, helps Trump get started, and he's going back to it because it works for him. And it puts the Democrats in the uncomfortable position, for example, of, of hiding the fact that when it comes to things like mass deportations, when it comes to things like caging children, when it comes to things like uh, the separation of children from their mothers by the thousands. This was Barack Obama that, that started us on that path, not, not Donald Trump. And so, you know, you see it when in the Iowa—in the, in the, in the Democratic debate, the, all the candidates run like rats when the lights go on when it comes to Barack Obama. They don't want to touch him because people, especially in the Latino community, know. We have the receipts of what happened with immigration and Obama. And so Trump knows this, and he's playing that card that, that shows him they have nothing to offer. This whole issue, as he was talking about <clears throat> criminal aliens, the, all the studies show that uh, people who are not native-born are less likely uh, to commit crimes, whether violent or not violent. And interestingly, as he touted the wall just a few weeks ago, newly installed panels from the U.S. border wall fell over. This was from California into Mexico two weeks ago because of high winds. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the wall is symbolic not just of immigration. I think it's the closing of the U.S. mind. And that's the trap that the, I think the, the Democrats have fallen into that they've played to anti-immigrant sentiment, except instead of saying racist tropes, they've said, si se puede. Right? So, they're, they're, at a material level, at the level of the immigrant body, the tortured, the starved, dehydrated, the dead child at the river and in the desert, there's not that much of a statistical difference between Obama and Trump. And so uh, Trump knows uh, Trump strategist knows what knows what they're doing when they're deploying immigration as an electoral uh, uh, tactic and, and and part of the core strategy. Uh, President Trump uh, also talked last night about Venezuela, a subject of, over which he hasn't been saying much in the last several months. But this is what he said last night. Maduro is an illegitimate ruler, a tyrant who brutalizes his people. But Maduro's grip on tyranny 
will be smashed and broken. Here this evening is a very brave man who carries with him the hopes, dreams, and aspirations of all Venezuelans. Joining us in the gallery is the true and legitimate president of Venezuela, Juan Guaido. <laughs> Mr. President. And the president then pointed to Juan Guaido, who was in the gallery, and stood up and got applause from both Democrats and, uh, I mean, not, well, not only Republicans, but from what I can see, from most Democrats as well. That's right. There's Nancy Pelosi mm -hmm. on the podium right behind Trump, who within <clears throat> minutes would be ripping up his speech, standing up and applauding. This is why I, 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 I started off my comments talking about the way that the, the Democrats use the same playbook as the Republicans at, at the core level of, say, foreign policy, militarism and staging coups and economic neoliberalism. There isn't that much of a great difference, which is what I think the Sanders threat uh, brings to both parties, because the Democrats are in check. I mean, I look at the irregularities in, for example, in Iowa. As I, I'm looking, I'm looking at a president who has been impeached, and I look at uh, the appointment of a foreign leader by fiat, by tweet, and now by television, televised speech. It, it, it's hearkening back to kind of a digital age Latin American dictatorship. We're watching the what I would call the Latino Americanization of U.S. politics when you have the division between rich and poor being so stark. And so Guaido's being there, um, I, I, it's just their continued efforts to prop up this failed coup, most recent coup attempt that's been going on almost 20 years in Venezuela. I've been on the show here uh, with, with, with both of you and, and, and talked about Leopoldo Lopez, who is really the great eminence behind the throne. Of, of the Venezuelan right, of the extreme right, because the Venezuelan opposition is vast. It's broad. And the U.S. and Elliot Abrams, who I know from El Salvador and his support for mass murders of children in places like El Mosote, uh, is, is supporting the most extreme elements. And so you have here the introduction of Guaido to prop him up, but also, I think, to play against Bernie Sanders and the socialist team. You heard Trump referring to socialism. He repeated the term, just like he repeated the tropes of civilizational warfare, civilization. He even said the word barbarians. So you have terrorists, immigrants, criminals, all these code words, all this red meat, as Li Fang uh, said, being used for the base. I mean, they're, again, both Democrats and Republicans play to these to these themes in different ways, except that, for example, I mean, they both draw from a guy named Samuel Huntington, who brought us to the age of civilizational warfare as kind of the post-Cold War narrative of a United States in decline. Also, the uh, Trump's mention of Guaido as a legitimate president uh, of uh, Venezuela, with 59 countries uh, recognizing him obscures the fact that there's over 100 com countries that still recognize the current uh, government of Venezuela. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's theater. It's all political theater at this point. It's a global political theater. And it's going to continue because the United States still has, after 20 years, failed to destabilize and, and remove Venezuelan government. And, of course, you also have the complicity of the corporate media, the mainstream media. CNN, when Juan Guaido's wife came to Washington, had a meeting with Trump in the White House, the lower third of the um, <laughs> description on CNN was um, the first lady of Venezuela. <laughs> Juan Guaido's wife. It, it's, it's really, it really is absurd. I mean, I, I was on your show some years back when Leopoldo Lopez, in 2014, tried to stage a coup, and I brought up the fact that I had been—I uh, received death threats, with a gun included, from allies of uh, Guaido and Leopoldo Lopez, his mentor. And, and I got calls from a guy named Agent Mike Ranger, who sounded like Captain America, curious about the death threat, and yet— I asked him, what, where, how do you know about this if I didn't report it to the authorities? He says, I'm not at liberty to tell you, sir. And so these are really, sh I mean, it's, it's, it's a joke at one level, but you're dealing with extreme right, extremely violent. And, and I encourage people to just Google Juan Guaido and narco killers or narco murders, and you'll see pictures of Juan Guaido at the Colombian Venezuelan border with people that the Treasury Department has identified as hardened mass killing. Narco terrorists. 
Well, I want to thank you so much for being with us and ask you to stay with us for our next segment, uh, award-winning journalist Roberto Lovato here in New York. And thanks so much to Lee Fong of The Intercept. We'll link to your pieces. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, American Dirt, the controversy around it, and why Latinx writers are now declaring victory. Stay with us.